Well, hi there. This is one of my absolute favorite turtles. One of the strangest of all reptiles. They're so weird that we have a whole video just about their necks. Because the Matamata neck is one of my favorite things in all of nature. But it is probably their heads that are the weirdest looking of all of their super weird structures. I mean, it is shaped like a leaf with two or possibly even more barbels, the goofiest toothless smile you ever saw, and a straw for a nose. Be honest, how could a face get any better? And I love that shell. It is a cooler looking shell than that of my favorite of all turtles, the common snapping turtle. It looks almost identical to the shell of the coolest looking of all turtles, assuming that the Mata Mata is not the coolest looking of all turtles, the alligator snapping turtle. With the spikes at the back and three large ridges or keels running down its back. It's a shocking resemblance given that there is no turtle alive today more distantly related to the alligator snapping turtle than the Mata Mata. As we covered in our phylogeny of all of the turtles, Mata Matas are side neck turtles. Snapping turtles, common and alligator, are hidden neck turtles. All hidden neck turtles are more closely related to other hidden neck turtles than they are to any of the side neck turtles. Meaning that, despite all of their apparent similarities, snapping turtles are more closely related to tortoises than they are to Mata Matas. But I love them all. Common snapping turtles, alligator snapping turtles, and Mata Matas are my three favorite turtles. But I don't have a Mata Mata, and I have no plans to get a Mata Mata. So why is that? Is the Mata Mata a good pet? And is it the best pet turtle for you? To answer these questions, we've returned once again to one of my favorite places on planet Earth, the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium in Draper, Utah, to give the Mata Mata a score based on our five categories, which are Handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the Mata Mata a score of two out of five. Handling a Mata Mata is not fun for anyone, but it is also not that hard to do. I say that it is not fun for anyone because the turtle hates it. It causes a lot of stress to the turtle and should only really be done when necessary. Also, the turtle is likely to whip its head back and snap at you like a common snapping turtle, though the snap is more startling than actually dangerous. These turtles are not biters. They don't really even bite their prey. They're just fish vacuums. I've personally never seen them bite through anything or successfully bite a human. But the sound of that snap is pretty surprising and it's very fast. Also, their claws could hurt at least a little bit. But the reality is that stress for the turtle is the reason to keep handling to an absolute minimum. The only reason we ever picked up this turtle was to verify which species it is. Mata Matas were recently divided into two distinct species, and the color of the bottom shell, the plastron, is the best way to differentiate. Welcome back to our studio. I just wanted to show you really quickly that we have a brand new table that was sent to us by the sponsor of this video, FlexiSpot. And this table is it's spectacular. In every way, this is definitely the best desk we've ever had. One thing, it is stable as can be, like no matter how big of an animal you have moving around up here, uh, this, this desk is not going anywhere. You can bump it, knock it, nothing is gonna move. And you know, the best thing is, you don't even have to sit behind this desk all day long because you can stand behind this desk as well. Not too shabby, but that's an impact trim or something that is. Good news, if a T-Rex ever walks by, you're not even gonna spill your drink. Not on this desk. And you can certainly type away without causing any sort of impact tremors. This thing goes sky high. It's so cool. And you know, it's not even just convenient, but it also just makes a dang good ride. It's the coolest desk ever. To the bottom floor, please. Whee! 
I'll be honest, you probably don't want to stand at your desk all day long, but you also don't want to sit at your desk hunched over, back sore all day long. What's nice is when you can do a little of each, and that is what you can do with the flexi spot. Putting the flexi spot together was a cinch. Look how quickly Jason and Will put it together. Use the links in the description and promo code CLINT to get 10% off an order of $400 or more. When it comes to care, water turtles are simultaneously easy and complex. You need to deal with water, including water changes, heating water, filtering water, and maintaining proper water quality. You also generally need to deal with land and proper basking lights and temperatures. Water turtles are just a pain which is why the only water turtles that I keep currently are common snapping turtles because they're just so worth it. But the upside to keeping water turtles is that they are usually hardy and tolerant of mistakes. So you need to deal with water, but if you get it wrong, it isn't that big of a deal. But that doesn't seem to be the case for Matamatas. So I've come here to the amazing Loveland Living Planet Aquarium to find out what they are doing to be successful with their Matamata. The Loveland Living Planet Aquarium is one of my favorite places on Earth. I want to live here in the South America wing of the aquarium. It is just absolute paradise. And I understand possibly an even cooler wing is coming in the relatively near future. Anyway, my family generally has a membership to this aquarium. And I spend a lot of time right here enjoying this turtle. And I've been doing so for almost a decade now. I don't know anybody else who has had long-term success with Matamatas, so let's find out what they're doing. I'm here now with Bob from the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium, who actually cares for their Matamata. This is definitely one of the longest lived uh, and healthiest Matamatas I've ever seen in human care. And so this is the right person to ask. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. T tell me a little bit about what it is like caring for a Mata Mata, like what does that look like every day, every week? Like what does a person who wants to keep a Mata Mata alive and healthy long term need to know about the care of these animals? Well, I could say for, for us, the, the care of this animal is mostly we take care of the water quality and then we, we feed it. And so it's all of its needs are sort of met. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did discuss this a little bit earlier, but uh, this Space is kept very warm, very humid. Humidity is probably about 60% in here. Mm -hmm. uh, temperature of our water is uh, usually somewhere between maybe 78 and 80 degrees. Um, it's a fully aquatic turtle, so it's gonna be in the water all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we feed our Mata Mata turtle twice a week. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feed it? Mostly fish. So occasionally we'll, we'll mix in some other things. We might feed it something like night crawlers or shrimp, mm -hmm. but we mostly feed it fish. Um, I've read studies where they've gone out and tested stomach contents of Mata Mata turtles and found that every single one of them had nothing but fish, uh, despite all the information that says that they eat a lot of mollusks and invertebrates and other things. Yeah, they're certainly adapted to hunting fish. That suction yeah. feeding, that is a, a fish eating strategy. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And do you give them live fish? Or is it like frozen fish that are, that are thawed out? It's frozen, fish? it's frozen fish. Mm -hmm. uh, so we usually will feed them. Um, typically, uh, we might do trout, smelt, and capelin are probably our three most common fish. Okay. Uh, we will often supplement it uh, with either some thiamine paste mm -hmm. um, or uh, some other uh, kind of multivitamin like Vitachem, which is a product that people use for freshwater fish, but it also has thiamine. That's the, the main thing. A lot of frozen fish, when it's frozen and thawed, it loses its thiamine. So we, we supplement with that. Um, yeah, and that's, that's about it for feeding. When you were talking water quality, uh, I assume that means filtration. How much do you focus on pH? That's a good question, because in where they live, mm -hmm. uh, usually their pH is going to be seven or below. Uh, if you look in the literature, it'll often say 6.5. Mm -hmm. uh, Matamatas, there's actually two different species of Matamatas as of 2020, mm -hmm. um, but they are found in the Rio Negro where the water pH can get down to three, even slightly below. Wow. Um, they're found in the, in the Orinoco, the Rio Negro, the Amazon River. Mm -hmm. um, so they're in a lot of different areas. 
um, but almost all of those are going to be well below seven. Um, ours are actually doing pretty well here where it's probably, I'd say usually about seven, six to seven, eight. And that's mm -hmm. just because of Utah's water is uh, so much more alkaline. Yeah. Um, and ours have, have managed to do very well. In so that. that hasn't been an issue for you. I, yeah. I, I've, I've heard a lot of people hypothesizing that one of the difficulties with the, the fragility of these turtles is just getting that pH right. But it sounds like this has got to be a turtle that's pretty tolerant of a wide range of pHs. Mm -hmm. So in addition to filtration, temperature, pH, there's also the, the importance of keeping nitrogenous waste in check. And I was also curious about how important water movement is. Mm -hmm. And you were saying to me that this is a, a 1300 gallon system. That's correct. Here, which, which means that you're not gonna see the rapid fluctuation in, in nitrogenous waste and things like that that could occur in a small enclosure. And, and, and talk to me about how important that is and how you guys regulate it here. Um, so it's, it's very critical. Um, I guess part of the, I'd say the first thing we do to regulate it is to test. So we do a lot of water testing. We test this at least once a week. Um, sometimes if we're concerned, we'll test it as much as every single day. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a big part because otherwise you just don't know. Just looking at your water, you think, oh, it's clean. You don't really know unless you're doing the tests uh, routinely. Mm -hmm. um, We've done it long enough that we, we can feel pretty comfortable doing it once a week because we feel like we've got it pretty established mm -hmm. and we know what our, that our routine is good. We use sand filters on this. There's mm -hmm. actually two, one sand filter and one media filter. We also have UV sterilization on this wow. system. So we we've kind of have a, a lot of uh, filtration equipment to keep this water clean. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we backwash those uh, sand filters once or twice a week and that means lots of water changes we're also doing vac vacuuming or we're vacuuming out the gravel mm -hmm. which also takes a lot of water out which we then replace again so we're doing lots of water changes and we have lots of filtration i think that's one of the biggest concerns uh, in keeping these turtles healthy Absolutely. is making sure that their water quality is the best out in, out in the wild nature takes care of that the water quality is usually really really good yes. the water is keeps constantly coming down the stream um, but here we need to make sure that we're providing for it. Um, as for flow, um, all I could say is I, I know our turtle really likes to be in the waterfall quite a bit. It's one of the most common places to find them here at the aquarium. As a member here, I've never seen that turtle farther away from the waterfall than it is right now and it's like three feet away. Mm -hmm. it's, it's usually under the waterfall. Yeah. So, and we're not sure if that's because it really likes the flow so much. Mm -hmm. it, um, a lot of times, that, a lot of these streams out there where they're found, there's, there's a lot more flow than you might expect. Mm. And we, we tend to imagine that a, a turtle that's going to be with a bunch of settled leaves is going to be in an area where the water's not flowing much. Mm. There's a lot of times there's more flow than you might think. Yes. Um, the other thing is uh, until over the last few years, we've really been building up the amount of foliage that we have around this exhibit. Mm. Um, and I, I think it, until that developed, the, the turtle probably felt a little more comfortable in the waterfall. It, it's just a theory, um, but that maybe then it felt safer in the waterfall because it wants to not be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we have more foliage, we have live plants in the water, uh, it, it feels a little more safer that it's not going to be seen as well. Uh, here's, here's a question for you. You know, they've got all kinds of fringes. They've got, they've got two pretty good little barbels down there on the bottom of the, the jaw. Uh, Will and I just last year we were down in in their range those rivers there is no visibility in those rivers How do you think that they're locating food generally? Um, so they're an ambush predator So they're basically waiting for fish to find them mm -hmm. or not find them and just come Get very close. very close to yes. them um, Apparently they do have really good eyesight, which is surprising yeah. because they're very it, tiny yeah, tiny very little eyes, eyes. Um, But apparently they have very good eyesight um but yeah, it just, it just depends. It, and maybe some of it, again, species, the, the uh, Orinoco versus Rio Negro versus Amazon, the waters are all very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be areas where it's very cloudy or where it's very clear, but their, their whole strategy is being an ambush predator. So they're looking like basically wood and leaves. Uh, a fish, in theory, will, will swim by, not really see them very well. Um, and then as soon as the fish gets within range, but when the matamata eats, 
it will open its mouth and expand its neck at the same time. It creates a vacuum that will suck the fish right into its mouth. Then you'll see it close its mouth and you can literally see the water come out as it's expelling the water back out and then it swallows the fish uh, whole and then digests it whole. That's one of my favorite things in exhibit. We have an entire video just about how Matamatas feed because it is, it's so pleasing to me. Mm -hmm. given, given especially that necks evolved because suction feeding no longer functioned on land. And then you have a group of, of animals like turtles that return to the water and now use the neck to do suction feeding. Mm -hmm. I don't know how something could get more pleasing than that. Yeah, and I don't know how I can expand my neck so I can get food into my belly faster. <laughs> that's would, the, that could be an advantage. That's the dream. Well, I, I really, really appreciate you sharing all this information. That it sounds like you know it's very, very well researched and obviously you're seeing success as a result. Thank you very much, Bob. I, I really appreciate all of that feedback and understanding. It, it makes me kind of see what you would need to do to keep one successfully. And with all that in mind, we are going to give the Mata Mata a score of three out of five. Of course, when it comes to hardiness, we give the Mata Mata a score of two out of five. And before this discussion with Bob, I would have gone lower still. Like I said, I don't know anyone who, to my knowledge, has had long-term success with these turtles except for this aquarium and other major zoological facilities. And I've heard a wide range of thoughts about why this is the case. Larger individuals seem to be hardier than smaller individuals, and this is true generally of turtles. Turtles are usually very hard to kill, and the bigger they are, the harder it is to do. That said, Mata Matas seem almost to be more like chameleons than turtles in this regard. Water temperature and quality seem to be extremely important, though as we've discussed here with Bob, they do seem to exist in a wide range of acidities in the wild. Something to consider that I don't think we normally think about is the temperature and humidity of the air. These turtles live in the water and rarely leave, but they still breathe air from the surface. Cold, dry air is not what they are adapted to inhaling. And everywhere that I have ever been that has successfully kept matamatas has been warm and humid, just like right here in South America. But to be honest, I don't know exactly why most people are not having long-term success with these turtles. And until I know exactly what to do to keep one successfully, I would not consider keeping one myself. If I can provide what the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium is providing, then great. But if not, well, I have snapping turtles. When it comes to availability, we give the Mata Mata a score of three out of five. The reality is that I have seen Mata Matas for sale at pet shops and even at expos, but usually you won't. They are almost always available online. Captive breeding is limited, so most are captive hatched or field collected, and most of them are field collected. So pay attention to your source. But the reality is that they are fairly easy to get. They are least concerned in the wild, though with the discovery that there are two distinct species, one or both of these species may not be as robust as we thought they were when we thought they were all the same thing. The reality is that there is not a lot of demand for this turtle. It gets very big, it looks cool, but it is pretty boring to watch, and it's difficult to keep successfully. And my hope is that this video does absolutely nothing to change that demand. This is not a very good pet turtle, and this is coming from a guy with two common snapping turtles, one of which regularly sits in his lap. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the Mata Mata a score of two out of five. The turtle is fairly expensive for a turtle, but really not as much as you might think. Three or four hundred dollars plus shipping would have one to your door tomorrow. But that would be a terrible idea because you need to have a proper setup ready before it gets here. Several thousand gallons of heated, filtered, frequently tested and changed water in a massive, warm, humid South American paradise seems to be great. How far you can scale that down and have success is, as far as I can tell, yet to be seen. They don't move much, so they don't need that much space for such a large turtle. But small aquaria with giant carnivores experience rapid and dramatic shifts in water quality. So the bigger the better, and more water in the system via a sump or something similar would probably be great. Be sure you have filtration and heating for that much water. And again, keeping air warm and humid might be absolutely essential. But stagnant air is generally not good for reptiles, so you might need to heat and humidify the whole room. All of the equipment to achieve this is simply not cheap. 
And this is why, overall, we give the Mata Mata a score of 2.4 out of 5. I really wish they were better pets. I love them so much. If you're having success with Mata Matas over multiple years, especially if you're breeding them, please, please share your wisdom in the comments to this video. I will read them. But if what you want is a spectacular, long-necked, suction-feeding turtle with a spiky shell that might not be very good to handle but makes a great pet, the common snapping turtle is the best pet turtle for you. But if it has to be an even spikier shell and be a boring ambush predator, then the alligator snapping turtle is the best pet turtle for you. But if it has to be the weirdest of all turtles, then it has to be the Mata Mata. But don't jump into it unprepared. We have links to preservation jars in our video on dragon snakes. You don't want that. But you can always come to the Loveland Living Planet Aquarium and enjoy this turtle. I might even see you here. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon.